welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Margaret M. Mitchell. I'm the Dean of the Divinity School and Professor of New Testament and Early Christian Literature. On behalf of the faculty of the Divinity School, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the University of Chicago Divinity School, to welcome you to Swift Hall for this conference on God, theological accounts, and ethical possibilities. The topic is ambitious, audacious, urgent, timeless, and timely at once hopeful and terrifying, as the poster art from Caravaggio's 1603 Sacrifice of Isaac, now in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, insists. The interdisciplinary interests and aspirations of this engagement with the central question of God and the good, divine nature and human behavior in Western thought is shown in the multiple co-sponsors for this conference, the Martin Marty Center, for the Advanced Study of Religion, the University of Chicago Frankie Institute for the Humanities, the University of Chicago Divinity School, the Norman Wade Harris Fund of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies, and the Arenberg Fund of the University of Chicago Center for Jewish Studies. And these are only a few of the communities of inquiry that meet in this conference. It is my pleasure on behalf of the faculty to welcome an outstanding list of international scholars Uh, who are coming to, or in some cases coming back, to Swift Hall. Pamela Sue Anderson from the University of Oxford, John Hare from Yale Divinity School, Aristotle Papinikolaou from Fordham University, welcome back, Telly, Uh, Myra Rivera Rivera from Harvard Divinity School, William Schweiker, um, where have you been, Bill? Uh, From the University of Chicago Divinity School, Mikhail Velker, welcome back, Michael from University of Heidelberg. And especially I want to recognize um, two uh, other members of the program who are really the generative engines for this conference. Miriam Renault, who is a PhD student in theology, and Joshua Daniel, welcome back Josh. Josh received his PhD in the Divinity School um, last year in 2013. And I would ask you guys to stand and be recognized for the work you've put into this conference. Now this conference also has keynote addresses by three eminent scholars, so very well chosen for the task. Professor Marilyn McCord Adams from Rutgers, Professor Michael Fishbane from Chicago, and Professor David Tracy from Chicago. I was struck, as maybe you were, by the fact that there's not one but three keynote addresses to this conference. And so I had a mental image of a keystone, and I thought of a lovely balance in an architectural arch of not just one well-placed piece that because of counter-pressure makes the whole fit, but rather of three nicely balanced ones. Though I couldn't really make that image work in my mind, and I thought the pieces might fall to the ground and hit someone on the head. So I was trying to figure out what exactly is a keynote. So for guidance, I turned, as I often do, to the Oxford English Dictionary. The first entry reads, in music, a keynote is the first note of the scale of any key, which forms the basis of and gives its name to the key. It is the tonic. And so in one of its early uses for this gloss, in 1677, Francis North, Lord Guilford, in an essay, philosophical essay on music, wrote, generally speaking, a tune must begin and conclude in the key note, because that note, and I love this, takes possession of the ear. Uh, in another citation from 1859, it was said about, of the walking tour of Brittany where they were listening to music, they never leave off the keynote there. The ear is left unsatisfied. So we're not about keynotes, or not about grace notes, which are incidental notes, but key notes, the note that's the sounding tone. 
So gloss three for the uh, OED is a keynote address is the prevailing tone or main idea of a speech, a piece of writing, or a course of action. This gets closer to our topic. Charles W. Morris, formerly of the faculty of the University of Chicago in philosophy, wrote the following. Receptivity should be the keynote of life. I thought that was a really nice phrase. And then lastly, did you know that it's an American invention to call a keynote address, this was new to me, a speech that's intended to set out or summarize the central theme of a conference, convention, advertising campaign, or to arouse enthusiasm for a party cause, etc., or the main or most prestigious speech at a conference or other event. And then there are references to Barack Obama, who being the Democrats' new wunderkind who delivered a keynote address in 2004 in Boston, and then how Apple computer always enjoys teasing its rivals, it is said, during a keynote presentation. From this trio of observations about what a keynote is for a conference that's constructed around three keynotes that frame this work, the topic of God and the good of theology and ethics does not allow of a single summative statement that can satisfy, that can satisfy but powerful evocations of tonic notes for us all to think and perhaps even sing or play with. These keynotes and all the notes and bars and measures and grace notes that will follow and interpose will possess our ears should we grant them the receptivity that Morris says is the keynote of life. Let the conference and the listening begin. Welcome to the Divinity School. Hello, I'm William Schweiker. I teach theological ethics here in the Divinity School, and I'm the director of the Martin Marty Center for the Advanced Study of Religion. I want to welcome you here. We have a couple practical matters to note, but to be honest, I really have to begin uh, with an apology. I'm really sad and apologize for the bad weather today. <laughs> Thankfully, tomorrow it's to be rainy and cold again, and we'll feel like we're really in Chicago. So my apologies for this. Um, one of the delightful things about the Divinity School and particularly the Marty Center is that we are able to generate events like this out of student interest. Miriam and Josh have already been recognized, but these, are, these conferences and events that arise out of student interests are a real engine for the kind of research we try to do here in the University of Chicago and the Divinity School. One last matter, practical matter, before I leave it to Miriam to introduce our speaker. The men's restroom is on this floor and the women's restroom is on the second floor. Okay, welcome all, Thank good to see you here. We have a real dynamic and widespread conference and we now begin with an introduction by Miriam Renault of our keynote, first keynote speaker. Good afternoon. Um, this, the planning for this conference has actually been going on for two years. So I thought this moment would never come, but here it is. And so it is such a pleasure to look out and see so many of you here and that um, so many amazing speakers are going to be participating in this conference. So it is my great privilege to introduce our first of the three keynote speakers in this conference, Professor Marilyn McCord Adams who specializes in medieval and philosophical theology. She has taught at a number of schools, including UCLA, where she was professor and chair of philosophy. Yale Divinity School, where she was Horace Tracy Pitkin, professor of historical theology, and Oxford University, where she was Regius, professor of divinity and residentiary canon of Christ Church Cathedral. She was also a member of the General Synod of the Church of England during some earlier stages of their sex and gender debates. She has been an LGBT activist since she was ordained as an Episcopal priest in Hollywood during the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. Professor Adams earned a BA in philosophy from the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and a PhD in philosophy from Cornell University. She then completed a Master of Theology and Biblical Studies 
and a Master of Theology in, developmental, in Development Psychology and Faith Development, both from Princeton Theological Seminary. Finally, she earned a Doctorate of Divinity from Oxford University. In the area of medieval philosophy, her books include William Ockham, What Sort of Human Nature, The Metaphysics and Systematics of Christ Christology, and some later medieval theories of the Eucharist, Thomas Aquinas, Giles of Rome, Dun Scotus, and William Ockham. She has also written two books on God and suffering, Horrendous Evils and the Goodness of God, and Christ in Horrors, The Coherence of Christology, as well as many scholarly articles. Her current projects include a book on medieval theories of the soul, and a constructive work on the sanctification of matter, which includes an attempt to revive perichoretic models of the self. Thank you. I'm honored to be invited. I, I don't think it would be very philosophical to hope to take possession of any hearers but maybe pro pro provocation would be a better goal. God, mascot or judge, God and the mores of church and society. Priorities, confusing and confused. The picture of God enthroned norming church and society is a Christian commonplace. The theories that underwrite it, however, are many and various, or at least several and contrasting. In practice, they lurk below the surface, with public ideology often misrepresenting the implicit presumptions that drive the action. How easily the normative and norming priorities get confusing and confused. Let me begin by distinguishing three models. The real God as judge. Metaphysical realists, such as I am, find it natural to begin with the reality of God whose being and excellence are ontologically prior and utterly independent. The real God is the ultimate explainer, the source of the being and well-being of everything else. The supreme excellence of the divine nature makes what God is some sort of norm or excellence in creatures. Created natural kinds can be recognized as more or less excellent depending on how much or how little they imitate the divine. God's attributes of wisdom and knowledge imply that God is an authority on human nature, on what is good for human beings individually and collectively. Surely the all-wise God would know what forms of social organization would promote human flourishing in which circumstances, which character traits would help focus human functioning to make it fluent, worthy, and delightful, which sorts of action would be appropriate when, where, and how. The all-wise God would know all of the mix-match combinations and so would be able to anticipate which sort of conditions would damage or obstruct human capacities or make for individual and collective dysfunction. The all-wise God would also know what sort of remedies might cut the losses and set things right. This by itself would make the real God a good source of normative information, but many Christians believe there is more. Already, Torah forwards a theology of life. God is life, for all else the source of life and its only reliable sustainer. Torah insists, because all life belongs to God, God is entitled that God's personal creatures should go along with God's program. Even some natural lawyers insist that it is God who institutes natural norms by promulgating and enforcing them. Moreover, as Dun Scotus insists, abstract consideration of human nature and various types of circumstances underdetermine wholesome social arrangements, which of many possible norms are actually in force will depend on free and contingent divine institution and or delegation. Thus, ontological and normative priority rest with the real God. God is both norm giver and judge of human society. Because human beings are the dimmest wits in the cosmos, because human imagination is perverse from our youth up, the human race is politically challenged. Knowing this, 
The Bible's God issues the Ten Commandments as minimal social guidelines. Because human beings in this world are too stupid and too scared to organize utopia, divine commands build in corrective measures. Fully aware of human limitation, the Bible's God does not require Israelis to hold all goods in common. The Bible's God does not even demand equality. Divine injunctions aim snake belly low at a decent standard of living for everyone. Employers must not withhold wages that would prevent day laborers from buying supper. Creditors are not allowed to take the poor man's cloak and pledge lest he have no cover against the cold at night. Sabbaticals honor creation by giving the land a rest. Even if the Jubilee year was never observed, the divine injunction to set the clock back and to return to square one with economic di distribution stood as a judgment on Israeli society and still sat, stands as a judgment against ours. That rich getting richer and poor getting poorer are not what the real God has in mind. Repeatedly in the Bible story, the real God not only judges Israeli society for its twin sins of idolatry and injustice, stubborn failure to institute mid-course corrections brings down divine condemnation. More than once, the real God proves willing to destroy Israeli society, to enforce a time out on nation statehood, for a period of years to cut Israeli culture off from its embodiment in lands and institutions before allowing it a fresh start. Durkheimian gods as mascots. Durkheim taught us how human societies are essentially self-deifying. They make an idol of their own survival and they forward a rival creed. Society is the source of life and its only reliable sustainer. As a sine qua non of individual existence, the survival and flourishing of society are what is sacred. Because individuals owe their existence to society, they owe it to society to be and to do their part to maintain society and to enable it to flourish. According to Durkheim's reductive program, gods are not ontologically independent or fundamental, but socially constructed all the way down, the projected personifications of society. In relation to society, Durkheimian gods do not have normative priority. On the contrary, society has ontological and normative priority and gods become the personal face of social mores. Presented as the authors and enforcer, uh, enforcers of society's norms and values, gods are in fact reduced to the status of mascots, whose job it is to represent and press society's aims. Because human societies are not really secure, gods also take on the status of an extra, po extra powerful social servants, the heavy lifting butler. Watch the oscillation in the Bible from the real God to genie and the bottle God for whom Israel's wish becomes God's command. God is a means to their end. God exists to go out with their armies and win their battles. God favors, indeed in the narrative, insists on the genocidal pogroms that Israel finds convenient, not to mention the ethnic cleansing post-exilic religious powers that be demand. God's job description also includes guaranteeing good weather, except in Chicago, and agricultural success downstate. Armies and natural disasters threaten human societies from the outside. Taboos are erected against danger on the inside to wall out behaviors and lifestyles that seem to threaten the very fabric of society itself. Taboos are irrational and inarticulate. To ask why something is forbidden is already to flirt with transgression. Durkheimian gods are the authors and enforcers of taboos. The Bible proscribes such behaviors and activities by marking them out as abominations to the Lord. God is real, but co-opted. As between the above two models, theocracies and ecclesial bodies typically refuse to choose. Instead, they insist on having it both ways. They forward God as real, fundamental and fontal, the rightful organizer of and norm giver for everything else. And they give it out that the real God has chosen this society, social group or institution to be a light to the nations, 
to embody divine ideas and pur deals and purposes. If you want to know what the real God has in mind for church and society, look no further. It is manifested in the social mores and modus operandi and canonical texts of this concrete and visible society, social group, or institution. Their bold boast is, the real God stands behind our ideas and mores. God gave the law to Israel and not to any other nation. We have the mind of Christ. We are God's vicars on earth. We have been chosen by God to convey divine messages and benefits to you. But otherwise, God is not socially constructed, but is institutionally co-opted. My thesis is that as much as Durkheimian reduction, such straddling confusion is pernicious because it takes God captive, surreptitiously turns God into a mascot, a symbol and servant of human social aims. Section two, taking Emmanuel seriously, God with us. Anthropocentric as the Bible mostly is, it tells us that God creates the cosmos to house divine, human, divine traffic with us. God calls and forms himself a people and purposes life together with us in this world, which is our natural home. The real God could, the Bible story God does, choose to work through specific individuals. For example, through Noah, through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and a particular nation, Israel. The Bible's God is represented as adapting human institutions and cultural products, even decorative styles, see the divine instructions on temple decor that modify the latest in Canaanite fashion, to facilitate life together. Even if, as universalists such as I am suppose, the real God does not choose some and neglect or reject others, the point readily gener generalizes. God pursues the divine goal of life together with human beings by meeting us where we are, by communicating and making relationship moves in ways that are recognizable in terms of human worldviews and social arrangements. Willingness to begin with human beings conceiving of who God is and interpreting divine actions in terms of human social analogies is a price that the Bible's God pays for life together with us. It would be a gross understatement to say that life together, the life together of God with human beings has proved a challenge for both parties. In the Bible, episode after episode shows how fraught with communication difficulties relations between God and the people of God can be expected to be. The Bible records the size gap between human being and who and what God is, is intimidating for us. God's ways are higher than our ways. Experiencing the real God is demanding, human partners readily believe that it is urgently important to the real God that we read divine intentions aright. Desperation for certainty and control begets insistence that there must be a way for the real God to get around or cut through our cognitive fog and effective confusion. Conviction that not getting it right would be dangerous to human health, individually and collectively, drives the theoretical posit that the real God has established proper channels through which the unadulterated truth of God's word can be commit, uh, transmitted and grasped. Reformation Protestants and today's conservative evangelicals identify this channel with the Bible, with God's word written, which they take to be infallible on its plain sense reading. Catholics have pointed instead to the visible church, which after all, fixed the canon of scripture. Infallible deliverances are found to be in the pronouncements of the ecumenical councils, the magisterium, and or the ex, ex cathedra papal decrees on matters, matters of doctrine and morals. 20th century critical theory exposed such devout hopes and the pure proper, proper channel theories to which they gave rise as conceptually confused. Once again, if God wants to communicate with us, God will have to speak our language. Grant that what God thinks is pure and unadulterated truth. Grant that God is clear about what God means. 
the moment we take it in, it gets translated into the language and housed in the conceptual schemes by which we organize and understand the world. Even if God transmits pure and unadulterated truth, our receiving it contaminates it with human ways of seeing and knowing. So long as God is content with inter-Trinitarian conversation, God can preserve truth pure and unadulterated. But God with us wants to communicate with us, and God knows truth cannot be received by us and stay pure. Divine human traffic is by definition two-sided, human as well as divine. Whatever God is and does, however excellent it is and holy, God with us will still have a human aspect. And we don't need 20th century critical theory to tell us what pessimistic liberalism already knew. Human being, collective as well as individually, morally even more than cognitively, is essentially fallible. Some morals of fallibility. We don't have to get technical to remind ourselves how human being is destined for partiality. We know, in part. We do not have what it takes to comprehend the material universe. Impressive as they are, the physical sciences proceed by successive approximations, developing competing models to manage unruly data, not only to enable us to cope, but to satisfy our Aristotelian desire to know. A fortiori, God is incomprehensible. God's ways are higher than our ways, even if the Emmanuel Project means that God is working overtime not to be utterly inaccessible. St. Paul declares, we see through a glass darkly, which implies that we do see something, but dimly, as in a tarnished mirror. Then there is the fact that human being in the world has evolved a variety of ways of being in the world. Cultures with contrasting takes on human being and our place in nature with a variety of non-congruent social structures for housing human interactions. Worse yet, because we have evolved as personal animals in an environment of real and apparent scarcity, our motivation is subject to Darwinian distortions. Animal instinct builds in a drive for individual and species preservation into an organism destined for death. Desperation to survive fuels a sense of entitlement to the necessities of life. Fear that it all depends on us breeds a willingness to do whatever it takes to grab more than we need. Roughly speaking, in-group altruism is bought by amplifying out-group hostility, all resulting in the proverbial struggle for existence in which the so-called fittest survive. Darwinian motivation combined with limited imagination is what leaves human beings politically challenged. Our social structures oversimplify. We can't seem to envision workable categories complex enough to fit everybody in. Our understanding of system dynamics is too poor to enable us to anticipate systemic byproducts. The result is that every human society spawns systemic evils that privilege some while degrading others. Intricate networking means that social roles and institutions are all at least complicit in and so contaminated by systemic evils. So are the language and conceptual frameworks, which are shaped by that social and cultural context. One moral of this story is that human, the human side of divine human interactions can't help being normatively twisted by the fact that human beings are neither smart enough nor good enough to organize utopia. It's old news, biblical criticism has long since made us aware, that the Bible stories and teachings are shaped by cultural context. Nor is there a single set of social arrangements that lies behind them. Bedouin ways of being in the world contrast with that of the Canaanite towns and villages with Hellenistic cities and the Roman Empire. We should not be surprised to find different texts at odds with one another with respect both to normative insights and to normative distortions. Put bluntly, the Bible is human as well as divine. It represents 1,700 years worth of distilled human attempts to articulate what was going on in divine human interactions. But from the human side, its texts are human cultural products whose normative perspectives are contaminated by the systemic evils of many societies that shape them. Their very status as canonical is likewise a human cultural product. 
For these reasons, the Bible is not a credible candidate for the role of pure proper channel. Taking the Emmanuel Project seriously means admitting the Bible says so and that settles it argument won't fly. So also for any and every ecclesial institution. However much God is willing to work with and through all of them, human side fallibility means the arguments, tradition says so, the Pope ex cathedra pronounced it so, the ecumenical councils agree that it is so, and that settles it, shouldn't achieve escape velocity either. To pretend that because they are divinely sponsored, human societies, institutions, or cultural products are above reproach is a form of idolatry that co-ops God as a mascot. For God, country, and Yale, the inscription reads, it makes the real God the author and enforcer of social and institutional norms and taboos and holds the real God eyes open directly and deliberately responsible for the systemic evils of university, church, and state. To be sure, the Bible's God is canonic. A second moral to my story recognizes a good sense in which, in choosing to be God with us, God abandons the status of being above reproach. For in meeting us where we are, God allows God's self to be cast in various social roles, or at least to be conceived of and related to as if God were playing something analogous to those social roles. For example, suzerain in relation to vassals, army general in relation to home tribes and enemies, jilted Bedouin husband to unfaithful wife. But social roles are themselves implicated in the systemic evils which arise from the social system in which they are enmeshed. Any role occupant, even one who disapproves of those evils and would seek to uproot them when made aware of them, remains so long as she or he occupies that role complicit in such evils. By agreeing to be cast in such roles or role analogs, God is consenting to be thought of as de facto complicit in such social ills. If this is true of the God of the Hebrew Bible, so also and all the more so of Jesus, of the God-man of two, two natures Christology. Nevertheless, in mixing it up with human society, God does not aim to lend unqualified qualified normative legitimacy to any part of it. God is more to be compared with the anti-war protesters or the civil rights activists who did not wash their hands of American society and flee to Canada, but stayed to work from the inside to tweak and transform, reform and or revolutionize our ways of being in the world. Scandalous co-option. So far, I haven't said anything new or original. Mutatis mutandis, pessimistic liberals, and neo-orthodox theologians have made such points many times. They might not bear repeating if it weren't for the fact that idolatry is a perennial temptation. Sex and gender crises in the Roman Catholic Church and in the Anglican Communion showcase just how pernicious pure proper channel models really are in practice. The perils of pre-Vatican II ecclesiology. The Roman Catholic clergy sex abuse disclosures were doubly scandalous. First and foremost, there was the horrendous harm to the children. Second and shocking was the pattern of institutional cover-up that simply reassigned repeat offenders and put still more children in harm's way. While many factors contributed to the climate that gave rise to the crisis, pre-Vatican II institutional model ecclesiology played a role by fostering default attitudes that put priests on a pedestal and placed the church above reproach. Lumen Gentium still reflects this picture, according to which the church is the body of Christ, which is in turn identified with the visible institution. If the Holy Spirit is the esprit de corps, the Spirit's relation to the visible institution is ontological, even, albeit without philosophical precision, a likened to that between the divine word and the human nature of Christ. Thus taught by the Spirit, the church is infallible, or at least ex cathedra papal pronouncements are held to be infallible. The church is overall, and in the end, indefectible, 
the Holy Spirit works through proper channels to teach the church all things necessary for salvation, and the Holy Spirit can't be wrong. Moreover, Christ himself intended to found a church and meant the apostles to establish a top-down pyramidal hierarchy with the successor of Peter, the plenipotentiary pope, at the top, then the bishops, then the priests subordinate to and instruments of their bishops, then deacons, then subdeacons, then laity, religious and unbowed, and the unbowed forming the broad, broad base. The rite of holy orders makes an ontological change in the ordinance, confers on the priest a sacramental character that conforms him to Christ as the head and shepherd, so that the priest is empowered to act in the person of Christ, and even within his assigned territory as a vicar of Christ. In subordination to pope and bishop, the priest heads by ruling and sanctifying his parish. Stretches of some documents seem to construe the priest's shepherding or pastoral function in terms of sacramental delivery. The sacrifice of the mass must be daily repeated to make the saving work of Christ present, alive, and accessible to the faithful who are prepared by baptism and screened by confession. From the pre-Vatican II perspective, still reflected in many documents outside the church, especially the Roman Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Sacramental participation is necessary for salvation. Therefore, priesthood pertains to the essence of the church, to its essa and not merely its bene essa. Like Christ the Good Shepherd, priests are gate and gatekeepers to the fold of eternal life. So that's all from documents, Vatican documents. Um, evidence of predator priests engaged in pederasty put church officials in a quandary. Identifying the body of Christ with concrete and visible Roman Catholic institutions places the institutions above reproach. Any evidence to the contrary must be denied or covered up to keep up appearances. Likewise, whatever goes wrong cannot be the fault of an infallible and indefectible institution. But already the Donatist controversy acknowledges priesthood has a divine and a human side. Considered as human individuals, bad apple priests could be scapegoated, denounced as exceptions who defile their sacred office by betraying their vows. Considered from the divine side, they are priests forever. The sacramental character conferred at ordination is indelible and marks them as brother priests entitled to fraternal support and institutional protection. Both sides were acted out, but for years the institution tilted more towards honoring the sacred office of priesthood by giving predator priests another chance in a different parish. When unwelcome data fail to fit favored theories, it's only human to deny or marginalize them as long as possible. Christ himself was thought to have placed bishops at least two layers higher on the institutional pyramid than the laity, with the result that the higher ups didn't have to engage concretely how bad it was for the victims. Ignorance was bliss, allowing the bishops to subordinate the gravity of sin, which for priests could be shriven in confession, and the harm to the victims in the interests of institutional damage control. Yet even at the level of theory, it's a moral fiction to suppose that the church can remain untarnished by what its clerics do. Both pre and post Vatican II ecclesiology stress how there is no such thing as priesthood outside the institution. What it means to be a priest is institutional through and through. If the priest gets his identity from his institutional role, he is thereby complicit in the systemic evils to which the institution gives rise. Conversely, institutions are expected to take responsibility for the deeds and misdeeds of employees who act on their behalf, all the more so for the behavior of individuals whom it trains and forms for institutional functioning. Church officials were misled by their pure proper channel theology into the conviction that the institution could train, keep, protect, and reassign predator priests while keeping institutional hands clean. Pre-Vatican II ecclesiology forwards the church as the pure proper channel chosen by Christ to guarantee secure delivery of spiritual benefits to the faithful. But institutional idolatry led the Roman Catholic hierarchy to betray its high calling 
and the very reason for being, for its being, by handing over the sheep to shepherds who devoured them. To be sure, Vatican II documents hint that because the church is human as well as divine, the church is always in need of reform, that perfection and holiness is an eschatological goal, not a presently entrenched reality. Some responses to the crisis um, acknowledge that the church is an institution, religious orders themselves sin, and for that reason, and not simply because individual members go wrong, need to repent and reform. Mid- and post-crisis documents on priestly formation tend to assign greater responsibility for selection and training to institutional authorities, especially bishops and superiors of religious orders. We can hope for more and better from Pope Francis. What is needed, I suggest, at the theoretical level is, not, is, is a sharper and more radical distinction between the body of Christ, the way divine providence is organizing the church, and any and all human institutional structures which are fallible and defectible, reformata et semper reformanda, and deserving of our loyalty only insofar as they remain skillful means of gospel proclamation. The Holy Spirit, the real God, is infallible and indefectible. But flesh and blood cannot inherit these features. The Vatican is wrong to think that it is an exception because in organizing the Vatican and its worldwide branches, not only Christ and the Holy Spirit, but multitudes of merely human beings are involved. The Bible stories already warned us. Attempts to co-opt the real God are medium to long run disastrous. Pure proper channels, Anglican style. I need to address my own house. From the mid-19th century, the Anglican Communion has been a loose federation of nationally independent churches around the world, whose globally scattered members owe their origins to British commerce and colonization on the one hand, and to British missionary movements, noticeably, notably the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge and the Church Missionary Society, on the other. Since 1867, the Archbishop of Canterbury has invited Anglican bishops worldwide to the once a decade Lambeth Conference. More recently, there have been more than annual meetings of the primates and triennial gatherings of the Anglican Consultative Council, which, radical, includes laity as well as clergy representatives from different provinces. These bodies, or as they came to be called in recent controversies, instruments of union, evolved to foster collegiality, to discuss issues of common interest, and to coordinate the better not to duplicate activities. Despite their Episcopal forms of government and liturgical roots in the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, the national churches, not only in the British Isles, but also in Africa, Asia, Australasia, and the Americas, are now indigenous and represent a wide variety of cultural perspectives. In any society, sex and gender taboos powerfully shape institutions and gender role expectations. They are strongly felt by individuals because they root deeply in the human heart. Little wonder then if six, the sexual revolution, women's liberation, LGBT pride movements in Europe and North America got Anglican leaders worried about whether the Anglican communion could hold together if Western national churches started to change sex and gender regulations. Changes did happen. The US church, tech, ordained women to the transitional diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopate. New Zealand and Canada followed suit. In 2003 and 2010, tech consecrated partnered homosexuals Gene Robinson in New Hampshire and Mary Glosspool in Los Angeles as bishops. In 2003, the Canadian Diocese of New Westminster authorized and immediately proceeded to use liturgical rites for the blessing of same-sex partnerships. Anglican leaders attempted first to avert and then to contain the crisis caused by such local church institutional policy changes by inventing a new polity for the global Anglican communion. You guessed it, or perhaps you remember how their arguments appealed to the concept of consensus fidelium 
to develop a pure proper channel ecclesiology of a distinctive kind. The project required some subtlety. Global Anglican primates, notably from Africa, Asia, but also in South America, not only judged, but condemned Tech and New Westminster. Many wanted to excommunicate them from the Anglican communion, to discipline them by excluding them from full participation in the instruments of union, or at the very least to force them to, ex to retract their actions, to cease and desist from implementing such institutional policy changes on pain of excommunication. Ecclesiologies that identified each national church or some aspect of its decision-making procedures as a pure proper channel would not meet the crisis. Instead, the Kuala Lumpur report and many other documents forward the thesis that while local churches can be mistaken, the church as a whole cannot be mistaken. Local has wide scope to include national churches, such as the Church of England, Tech, or the Anglican Church of Nigeria, dioceses, such as the Canadian Diocese of New Westminster, and parish congregations. These taken by themselves, acting and teaching alone, are not infallible. The church as a whole ranges over time as well as space. The church as a whole includes Christians from the beginning of Pentecost down through the ages. The church as a whole encompasses not only Anglican provinces worldwide, but also favorite ecumenical partners for authors of the documents and the erstwhile Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, that meant Rome and Eastern Orthodox churches. A necessary condition of certainty about essentials is transtemporal and global consent. From this, Anglican from this, Anglican communion officials drew the corollary. No local church should proceed to give institutional expression to changes in the essentials of doctrine and praxis unless and until the change has been received by the church as a whole. However much Archbishop Williams and Anglican Communion Covenant drafters were thinking on their feet, they sincerely believed in pure proper channel theories in this neighborhood. Such ecclesiologies wear their conservative bias on their face and would, if adopted, give sex and gender conservatives the results they wanted. The church as a whole has not everywhere and always ordained women, ordained or blessed partnered homosexuals. The church as a whole has not and still does not receive such institutional changes as acceptable. And for that very reason, national churches in more liberal societies have not warmed to the dictates of these pure proper channel ecclesiologies. For one thing, transtemporal -temp consensus fidelium slippery slopes into a strong argument from tradition. For transtemporal -temp consensus fidelium requires unanimity or always or for the most part agreement among the faithful. Perhaps more realistically, it demands that official institutional decision-making procedures down through the ages yield the same results. Since the past cannot be changed, this amounts to a privileging of what has gone before. Founding documents and the decisions of past ecumenical councils become the norms to which later generations must conform. Likewise, past institutional practice uh, sorry, both, both Cardinal Casper and Metropolitan Zizoulas warned the Church of England's General Synod, down through the ages, the church has not recognized the ordination of women to the priesthood, much less the episcopate, and that settles it. Ecclesial bodies in the present are not free, that's their phrase, not free, to deviate from this piece of positive divine law. Everyone knows that churches down through the ages have not agreed about all matters of doctrine and praxis. Pure proper channel theories take the consensus fidelium to apply only to essentials. In the Anglican communion disputes, what fueled the promotion of sex and gender policies from adiaphora to essentials was the righteous indignation of some Anglican provinces when Tech and New Westminster violated their sex and gender taboos. Sex and gender became essentials over which the church cannot agree to differ because the human side of ecclesial, ecclesial institutions has always been shaped by social taboos. Conservatives charged that Tech and New, West, New Westminster had been taken captive by the spirit of this present age. My retort has regularly been, 
consensus fidelium, sliding into the strong argument from, tradi from tradition, co-opts the real God to author and enforce past taboos, and so make the whole church captive to the spirit of past ages. In Anglican communion disputes, consensus fidelium is also given geographically wide scope, the better to establish global harmony. But clearly, this is a vexed strategy. Everybody knows there are vast cultural differences among, say, African, Asian, and Middle Eastern societies on the one hand, and European, North American, and Australasian countries on the other. Durkheim was happy with henotheism or polytheism. Each society will have its own god or gods to promulgate its own worries and ideals, and societies were free to engage in my god is bigger than your god rivalries. But where the real god has been co-opted to underwrite cultural biases, a global god is going to authorize a plurality of conflicting social practices and taboos. But those who sponsor global consensus fidelium as a pure proper channel do not want to endorse a to each its own religious and, or cultural pluralism. On the contrary, where essentials of doctrine and praxis are concerned, conservatives are inter, inter, insisting on cross-cultural agreement. They want the result that local churches are not free to give sex and gender changes institutional expression unless and until the change is agreed worldwide. Sex and gender liberals might be tempted to an uncharitable paraphrase. Not until God, the mascot, repents of misogyny and homophobia. Not until there's a divine change of heart. The real God as subversive. Pace Durkheim, Durkheim, the real God is too big and too real to be socially constructed. The real God is not really co-opted or co-optable either whatever human societies and institutions like to pretend. The real God is both ontologically and normatively prior. The real God is not restricted to the opinions of being, being an aloof, he's not, not restricted to the options of being an aloof norm like a platonic form, or being reductively absorbed a la Durkheim, or being real but institutionally co-opted as in the pure proper channel theories. The Bible tells us that the real God is God with us, God meeting us where we are. Universalists imagine the real God meeting all sorts and conditions of human being where they are. So the real God does work in and through a wide variety of humanly devised institutions and social systems. In doing so, God allows God's self to be cast in analogs of their social roles and so relates to members of that society through them. To that extent, the real God is complicit in the systemic evils that those social systems and institutions spawn. Nevertheless, the real God does not work in and through humanly devised so societies and institutions in order to lend the norm normative legitimacy to them. The real God infiltrates humanly devised societies and institutions to subvert them, allows God's self to be cast in role analogs first subtly and then blatantly to caricature them. The real God first gets to know and then co-ops prophets to point out the symptoms and trace back to the causes of systemic evils, to warn and persuade, to co-opt others to join the real God in working to dig them out. Because systemic evils are so systemic, so intertwined with everything else, they cannot all be yanked out at once without leaving the society in shambles. The real God shares divine wisdom with co-opted co devotees about which, about which evils are ripe for uprooting at any given place and time. Because God, divine names are global, God moves in with people in very different cultures at the same time. Because societies are organized so differently, and because each and all of them are in flux, what is ripe for uprooting in one culture may not be on today's prophetic agenda in another. The real God has the wisdom and the subtlety to design distinctive syllabi to suit each, in, each situation. The real God has insight and sensitivity to recognize which individuals are here and now co-optable for what cause. Societies can stay creative for a long run if they are willing to be subverted into mid-course corrections. But all human side societies and institutions eventually wear out and collapse of their own weight. 
In any event, the Gospels compare the kingdom coming to leaven in the lump that infiltrates and expands secretly. Unless it's punched down and reformed, the whole mass will explode. The Gospels imply that kingdom coming will be utopia, that the real God aims at societies in which there are no systemic evils, in which the common good is achieved by seeing to the well-being of each and all. Only the real God is smart enough and good enough to organize utopia. But God with us is two-sided. For us to be with God in utopia, God will have to bring the human side, mutatis mutandis, into harmony with the divine side. Among other things, God will have to overcome our Darwinian motivations and win our unreserved trust. Only the real God knows how to do this. Utopia is an eschatological goal. What we do know is that God's interim strategy is to co-opt us through working together to acquaint us with divine ta tastes and values, more and more to win us over to the divine side. Thank you. We have about a half hour for questions. I'm Michael Lishvalier from the University of Chicago. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it was great to have you speak here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the sharp distinction that you want to lay out between um, the institution and the body of Christ, so to speak. Um, I, I certainly agree with you in many respects that there's sort of a danger in confusing um, in practice uh, church militant and church triumphant, or as I've heard it recently, the, the, the stainless garment of the church, um, to confuse that with the album of the priest or the um, altar cloth of the church. And yet at the same time, I worry that drawing, two, drawing uh, a very sharp distinction or to break off the possibility of, um, of church communions as participating in the body of Christ is a way of also um, introducing an element of despair into our sense of communities. That is to say, if we don't have the possibility not just of, of um, pointing towards some future utopia, um, but, but really having that possibility of seeing that in our midst now, whether it be within church communities that talk about Eucharist as being one of these places in which there's a union both with God and with each other, um, or whether it be um, communities um, around um, sacred texts. However, however it gets figured, there are several ways in which communities already have that here but not yet um, that, that doesn't have as sharp of a break. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how, or, or maybe more clearly identify what you see that sharp break as being. Um, the way I see the sharp break the way I see the sharp break is this. I think that the human side of institutions is something that is um, um, provisionally useful, right? And that therefore it has no, um, uh, basically that humans, human, from the human side, any institutions or so social arrangements we come up with are going to spawn systemic evil. So while they may have good making features, they enable life together, they enable all kinds of um, good things, they also have an underbelly. Right? Um, um, I, when I was in England for five years, I tended to think of England as the most civilized country I could think of. Um, but you know, within two blocks of the cathedral, there's the place where Cranmer, Latimer, and Ridley were burned. Right? There's the, right outside the cathedral door is a long list of, of um, of young men who uh, died in, war, in, in the wars, and of course there are equally long lists of young men who died in the wars on the other side of the channel, right? So um, even the most civilized, if you, our best efforts to organize ourselves socially, the best institutions we can come up with, um, um, are usually carry with them a willingness uh, to uh, degrade other people if necessary for our survival, right? And, and so it seems to me in one way and another, right? And so therefore I think that to suppose that God is in favor of that 
or that God puts God's seal of approval on a human institution is to make God the author and, and enforcer of those um, evils. And because God would, would recognize them in advance, whereas they happen to, they sort of spin off at us and get surprises at times, um, God would be doing an open eye. So, um, so what I want to do is to distinguish between how God is organizing the people of God and how we are organizing it in various institutions and social structures. And that doesn't mean that God is remote. I mean, that was part of my point, that God is with us, God is involved with us, God makes use of these institutions to connect with us. I assume that God made use of the institution of animal sacrifice to connect with Israel, too. That doesn't mean that God puts God's eternal stamp of approval on animal sacrifice, or not, right? I mean, uh, it, it's, it's one thing to say that God relates, relates to us through institutions and through uh, institutional structures, and it's another and, and text that we formulate and so forth, and it's another thing to say um, that uh, God uh, has put that seal of approval as this is exactly the right thing, this is exactly what I had in mind, right? Um, I mean, it, it's, it, so the whole point is this, that these, the canonical texts and uh, ecclesial institutions arise because um, God is taking the initiative to have life together with us, right? And it's our way of receiving the communication and activity that God is engaged in. But once we, our way of receiving it is always um, screwed up in various ways, right? And however, whatever good making features it has, it also has bad making features. And if we try to, my, my, my claim is that if we say, well, this is exactly what God wanted, then uh, we, this is a piece of idolatry, and it makes us liable um, to um, um, not be alert to what we the, uh, the uh, institutional evils that we should be that God is calling us to uh, get busy and approve. Hi, I'm, I'm David. I really appreciate your talk. I'm a student here. Um, my, my question is, how do you see the church functioning as an organization that says that has something that unifies it and is able to say something to the world? It, it seems to me that um, your, your hesitance to say anything from the church comes from God and from a clear and sure channel. Um, makes it hard to say at all what the essence of the church would be. And that makes it really hard then to, to organize the church, right? If, if we're always open that this local community has a new vision, subversive vision from God, and this one does too, and then that one does, how, do, how does the church avoid just sanctioning the liberal progression of thought. Sanctioning the liberal progression of thought? Right. Liberals are sinners also. So, um, uh, uh, it's, uh, I hate to think that the church didn't have any mission just because, um, just because we don't have any infallible, pure, pure proper channels, right? I, I wouldn't think that that was necessary for the church to have a mission. What's distinctive about the church? The church, the church or ecclesial bodies, Organize the, to help people grow in the knowledge and love of God and whether Christian churches are, as revealed in Jesus Christ. That, and and it's a, these institutions are focused on that project. There are lots of institutions in society that are focused on many other things, right? Um, uh, so that's the project. And we can be focused on that project and try our best to carry it out while knowing that we may get a lot of things wrong. We think people got things wrong in the past. Many of us do, I certainly do. And um, we are probably getting things wrong also. But what we're counting on is that God is going to uh, still be trying to get through to us to, to make mid-course corrections to get us to, to see things a little straighter. So I think that the distinction between the church and uh, other human social institutions is not that the church is a pure proper channel, or some aspect of it is a pure proper channel of, of God's uh, truth, uh, but rather that um, that we're, we're intentionally focused on trying to hear that message and put it into practice individually and collectively. And um, uh, yeah, I guess that's what I think. Um, so is there is there a way for the church then to say ever that that 
some measure of it is wrong in its, in its interpretation of loving and knowing God better. We say that all the time, right? Right, but should it, if it doesn't have anything? Do we need need infallible guidelines in order to correct one another? It seems to me that we better not need infallible guidelines to correct one another because we, in my view, we don't have any. Uh, can't have any, right? So basically what we're, what we're dealing with is uh, trying to, trying our best to see clearly and being open to correction. Um, and I think it's really important um, um, Nowadays, that while the distinctiveness of the church is uh, helping us to uh, trying to, to focus on growing the knowledge and love of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, that's that's our mission. That's what we're trying for. That's what we're trying to carry out. Um, um, that that doesn't mean that we've got it right on every on every issue, right? And that um, when people start saying, "Oh well, if you if you uh, say, look, in our country, uh, there's there's LGBT marriage, right?" And so, therefore, the church had better change to catch up. Um, and that's, that's submitting to the spirit of this present age. What I'm going to say is, well, why do we think that the church can't learn from the state just as this, the state has to learn from the church? I mean, in the civil rights movement, the state took notice of the fact that all these church people, under Martin Luther King and others, marched on Washington and raised the ruckus and said, let's, let's change the way we manage things racially, right? Um, but maybe, maybe when it's sex and gender, um, the, the church needs to listen to secular society. Maybe they got something right. I mean, we're all fallible, but that doesn't mean that the church has no distinctive vision. I see. So I, I, I you might say that I agree with everything you just said. What? But, <laughs> but uh, so if we have Pakova, there's been a book called Russian Orthodox Church and Politics. And she identifies three trajectories, let's say, within the Russian Orthodox world. Fundamentalist, the traditionalist, and the liberal. Mm -hmm. And so it struck me that everything you just said now, which I agree in the sense, would like, not even convince the fundamentalist trajectory at all, which makes me wonder not in critical, way, critical way, just more of a question. I'm wondering who you're trying to convince, in some sense. And wait, and, and there's a sort of series of disconnected thoughts. And so, in some sense, it makes me think that the institutional church. Uh, so I like this thing by the Christ institutional, institutional church. The institutional church has to somehow manage these various ways of embodying the tradition, right? But then. More and more, as we're seeing, especially in the West, there are those who are just simply opting out. There, there's a deinstitutionalization occurring. No matter whatever argument you may sort of offer. Deinstitutionalization of religious practice, you mean? Or? Yeah. And I think that makes me think you could reflect a little more on the other side of the kind of theology you have, too, especially in Christ and Horror, is about what God is doing with us. Uh, whether you think that uh, in any way, um, that kind of can occur in any way that's traditionalist, and in some sense, you can sort of comment on sort of how you see the mutually constitutive sort of relation between institutionalizations and institution and tradition. Whether you can really conceive tradition without institution and vice versa. And in that sense, I guess what I'm really aiming at is whether the opting out is is really an, an option that you think is something that uh, I don't know. Uh, what would you say to the opting out thing? Like this? <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, there are lots of things there. Uh, lots of things. Who am I trying to convince? I was trying to convince malleable people who hadn't been thinking about this subject. Yeah, but they're leaving. I know. That's not true. I mean, I came to these views in the uh, sex and gender debates in the uh, in, in the General Senate of the Church of England, and uh, there are lots of people there who were uh, getting the pure proper channel view from the Archbishop, right? And we trust our Archbishops, don't we? And I think, why? Um, I mean, uh, I'm an American. I don't trust my, you know, um, I, I, I argue with them, and then they, they will deliver. That's my advice. 
that's my philosophy, but that, that's a very American philosophy. So um, the point is, um, so there were lots of people who were tempted to go that way and not think it through. And I was trying to say, hey, wait a minute. Think, think through, uh, think it through uh, what you think about human nature in general. Think it through about uh, the way these institutions operate and how they have, what their institutional track record is. Think it through what the implications are of this Anglican Covenant and what, what that's really saying about, uh, what that will really say about uh, social justice issues and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so I was, I was trying to persuade them. So of course, uh, the, the, uh, I did try to persuade, I did try to persuade that I was a member of a, a conversation across the divide, uh, so to speak, with, that had uh, um, very radical evangelicals um, uh, who thought, of course, that I would certainly not be joining them in the heavenly places. Um, <laughs> but, but we did become friends over TV and uh, cake, all the same. So you never know. Um, now, as for deinstitutionalization, uh, I'm not particularly in favor of deinstitutionalization. I'm a, I'm a clergy person. Uh, that means that uh, it's a kind of for better, for worse uh, situation, right? Um, but, so I'm sort of a person who thinks you ought to, that, that it's my vocation in any event to, to stay in the institution and uh, to be uh, provocative, if possible, um, and to try to improve it, if possible, and to try to, to uh, move it along. Um, uh, but I think that the deinstitutionalization that you are addressing yourself to is not something that um, it, it's something that's happening quite apart from any advocacy on the part of church leaders, right? It's it's rather it, it's rather uh, that lots of young people um, want to have a connection with a transcendent reality, uh, but don't find the institutions that we have in our societies as helping them make that connection or helping them make it in a straightforward way or something like that. And um, I think that's something that th that is a great call for um, self-examination for institutions to ask, well, look, um, what, what is it that we missed, right? What is it that we haven't been doing that makes our institution no longer helpful in people, helping people grow in the knowledge and love of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. Where did we miss out here? Um, so I think that from the church's point of view, we should be, this is a kind of call to self-examination and, and thinking, uh, not, not because we uh, were losing numbers, but because we haven't been doing our job, which is what I was thinking was our distinctive job, the thing that uh, political parties and uh, you know soup kitchens won't do, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, something, something um, that is our, our calling. Um, but as for the young people, well, um, that's where they are. They can't find, uh, they don't seem to find any help in, uh, in the institution. So I mean, I can't really blame them for that. I guess. Okay, let me count this off. One, two, three. Hi, I'm Olivia. Um, I have a couple of questions. Thank you very much for your talk. They're both very basic questions. Forgive me if they're too basic. So I really liked your point that um, aiming for trans-historical doctrinal consensus kind of dooms us to co-opting God to underwrite past taboos or dooms us to enshrining past mistakes. I wonder if you could just boil down for us what your vision is of how we ought properly to lean on tradition. So if trans-historical consensus is wrong, what is properly admissible in a positive sense? Like, to what extent and how can we lean on tradition as opposed to merely critiquing it? And then my second question, if you don't mind, um, is eschatological. So you said at one point that um, we have to think carefully about what is the task of our day, and that uh, a problem might not be ripe for pruning in one culture, but it's ripe for pruning in another. And I'd just like to hear you reflect on the sort of temporality of the eschaton. So are we in some sort of progressive movement toward the eschaton, or do you conceive of it differently? Thanks. OK. Um, let's see. Okay, how do we engage tradition? So, so my, my basic line is, God is very, very big, and we are very, very small, and very, very stupid. 
And so we cannot possibly hope to get a grip on who God is and what God wants and how God loves and what our purpose and reason for being here all by ourselves or in one generation. And we have to continually draw on the wellsprings of tradition to get a focus and a direction um, uh, uh, to, to, um, um, to make any progress, right? So um, um, I, I'm a medicalist, and the medical method seems to me to be really helpful. And in the Middle Ages, their primary method in the High Middle Ages was to question and dispute authority. There were canonical texts. There were uh, you know, the Bible, and there, and there were church document, church, uh, church uh, pronouncements that they regarded as infallible. And then there were secondary authorities of Augustine and other theologians, blah blah blah. And what they did was constantly question and dispute them. And the point was, even with the infallible ones, and the point was not uh, that they were with the infallible ones; they weren't going to turn out to be wrong. But they wanted to understand where the what was, what the heck was going on, right? So they, so they kept digging into it, digging into it, digging into it. And of course, with the secondary authorities, they did say, well, you know, nice try, but we don't think that was right. right? Um, so um, I think that we have to do the same. But I think that there's a big difference between not engaging tradition, saying tradition is irrelevant, we don't, you know, and let's see what we can make up for ourselves, right? And saying, okay, here's tradition, it's not infallible, but we have to begin, we have to, we're, form, we're already, those of us who are here, are already formed and informed by it, and, we, and the proper posture is to question and dispute it, and in the course of doing that, um, we will come to various views about what we think is a better focus and what they, what they got really right and what we got not so right, right? And then we might, you know, in questioning and disputing, we might also think, well, why did they think about it that way, right? So we not only want to know what they said, but why did they say that, and how did they get there, right? And when we do that, then we sometimes, um, you know, that can, that can be illuminating as to whether or not it's got normative uh, uh, purchase on us. Um, so I'm very much, I spent my whole life uh, in historical theology, right? So I'm, I'm really into it, uh, but I don't think any of it's infallible. Thank you for your lecture. Um, if I understand rightly, I completely agree with you that this first and most profound theological task is to distinguish between our words about God and God, and not to confuse these. That the divine is not what a particular religion or community says is the divine. That is the real God over against the institutional God. Am I following you so far? Uh, okay. I mean, I don't want to get too apathetic, but yes. Okay. Um, if, if, if I could go in a very apathetic direction, I probably wouldn't go there, but still. If that's part of the theological task, I'm a little confused about what theology contributes, if anything, to the process of moral learning and moral knowledge. Or if that's merely a process of amelioration in engaging different communities and different folks. A point which I incidentally agree with. What theology contributes? Yeah, I'm trying to understand what exactly theology contributes positively well, to the process of moral learning. Well, in every age, theologians are trying to figure out, they're engaging, in my view, they're questioning and disputing authority, they're trying to get a grip on... Well, that's uh, a descriptive claim. I'm asking normatively. Normatively. I think I don't understand the question. I mean, I, because I think all the things I said apply to ethical statements as much as to statements about the nature of God. Um, um, so um, I'm thinking that God, the real God is the norm. Theology tries to know the real God. It always is an approximation probably a pathetic approximation, but it's an approximation, it's that we do our best. Um, and uh, the real God is a source of norms, and so there should be, uh, and you can have various theories about this. Notice I did not take a position on divine command theory, or two core, or whether you think it's the divine essence that it, you know constitutes the norm of what's good, and then you sort of 
presumably you hold that the scope of moral knowledge is greater than that of religious community. In other words, you don't. Have yes, to, I do. Okay, I I'm do. asking for the theological background for that. Huh? What I'm asking for, in a sense, is the theological reasons oh. for that claim. Okay. A claim which I have to agree with. I'm just wanting to know. Well, I'm because God is the creator of human beings, right? And uh, of all human beings. And human being and what's bad for it and good for it is something that we have a lot of data about, right? God is uh, very, very big, but we are, we are ourselves, and we have a lot of observational data about what's good and what's bad, right? And in particular, since I'm a pessimistic liberal, I think that what's most important in these critiques that I was referring to is to look at what's really bad. And we are experts on what's really, really bad. Job is an expert on how bad his suffering is. He's not an expert on how bad is running the world, but he's an expert on how bad it feels, right? And we're an expert on what is indecent. You know, we can, we can, if we notice, take notice, right? We can see what is just, what kinds of conditions make life intolerable for people, right? That's something that we can know. And that, that's something that, that, uh, that we know, that we are in, in touch with, partly because of just being human beings, right? And so, um, so I think that a person who's actually believing in God doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, make them more sensitive to what is indecent um, than, um, you know, I mean, think of, well, we, I, we can go through the history of, of uh, things ecclesial bodies and uh, church groups have done to one another uh, in the name of God, right? And we think, well, those things were indecent to do. You know, torturing is indecent. You know, we don't need somebody to tell us that. We, we can just look at it and see, right? Um, uh, we don't need a, we don't need a canon to tell us the torture is decent. Um, yes. So, so I, know, you, oh, you want? I know we have a line of people, um, but we're running out of time, so I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go to the next person in line and then cut it off. But other people can come up afterwards in the next couple of days. Thanks. I have a You're fine? I'm fine. Ma'am? Bye. You had raised your hand earlier. I did. I did indeed. Uh, I uh, I agree with. I, I seldom heard the talk with which I agree more. I would I would like to point out one thing in which you uh, uh, talked about that we always we. Um, okay. I can find the quote here, but but what you're saying, of course, is that we have to put uh, our religious understandings in uh, in relationship with the kinds of understandings that, that uh, power our society as, as we go through uh, history. Uh, and uh, I, one thing that I think has not been mentioned here and that is perhaps relevant to your, your remark over here about uh, uh, perhaps younger generations has to do with both science and technology. Uh, technology in its uh, in its effect on how we all live our lives. Um, but the sciences are, in fact, changing, I think, in many parallel ways for, across the sciences, and, uh, having particularly to do with various kinds of interactions and the importance of interaction as a basic reality. Uh, some of you probably know about the Chicago Social Brain Network, and it's, uh, uh, they published a, a, a a book recently authored by the Chicago Social Brain Network. Uh, I'm not part of them, but I admire what they're doing, in which uh, they're talking again about personal interaction as, uh, as emerging as uh, a very important way of uh, defining human good, uh, human necessity, uh, the necessity for certain kinds of interaction in order for human beings to thrive. Uh, I think that, that uh, if we're going to talk about the changes that are going on across our society, and that in fact uh, will affect coming generations and their way of understanding what is real, if uh, some of you know that I do work in religion and science, but I, I think that it's something that needs to be concluded, even though it may be an extra stretch. Uh, I'm sure. It, I'm sure it will be. It will be relevant. 
Yeah. Um, join me in thanking Professor Adams. Mm -hmm. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.